Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us for our Thursday edition of the weekly COVID-19 situation report. And um, great to have you join us on this beautiful sunny day. Um, pleased to see we've got a great turnout from our media partners um, and uh, welcome also to our elected officials. Uh, pleased to see our board chair, Andy Mitchell, uh, Mayor of Selwyn Township and uh, Mayor Tarion have joined us and um, MP Monsef I see is on the line. So we look forward to hearing from you in a little bit. Um, I will um, start us off um, with acknowledging the beautiful land that we are fortunate enough to call home. And um, I will respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough Public Health is located on the Treaty 20 Michisagig territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagig and Chippewa nations collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. So with that, I am now going to invite our board chair, uh, Andy Mitchell, to uh, start us off with some opening remarks. Please go ahead, Andy. Thanks, Brittany. This past week has seen both encouraging and some troubling developments in the battle against COVID-19. Vaccines have arrived in the Pedro region in significant numbers, and more is scheduled to be delivered over the next two weeks. Vaccinations are now beginning for additional vulnerable populations and will continue as part of a coordinated local effort. Testing continues to be robust, hospitalizations remain low, and local outbreaks are being contained. Other news, however, is less encouraging and speaks to the need for everyone to remain vigilant. This past week, a variant of concern has been discovered locally. It demonstrates how important adhering to the new screening guideline is. We need to give ourselves the best chance to minimize the variant spread. After a number of weeks of declining cases, there has been a modest increase in the last two weeks locally. This trend is also being seen in other parts of the province. As we approach the first anniversary of the pandemic emergency, COVID-19 fatigue appears to be accelerating. It is important to remember the fastest path to a return to normalcy is to stay the course and resist the urge to let our guards down. Please, everyone, continue your excellent efforts to adhere to the basic public health guidelines. Do not assemble in groups for social gatherings, especially indoors. When dining out, sit only with household members. Wear a mask when away from home. When with others than when with others than your household members, maintain a physical distance of two meters. Wash your hands frequently. If you or a family member COVID symptom, stay home, seek medical advice, and get tested. Together, we will continue to contain COVID-19, keep ourselves, our families, and our communities safe. Stay well, stay well, be safe, and in all things, be kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Mitchell. Okay, so let's um, have a look at our current data and I will um, invite Dr. Salvatera to um, lead us through these next few slides. Please go ahead. Thank you, Brittany. So I'll start with our situational update. As of 4.30 p.m. yesterday, there were 34 active cases and you can see that include uh, they are included in our total case count of 619 cases to date. We are also reporting one variant of concern. We are continuing to follow a large number of high-risk contacts, 156, but this is less than last Friday. Next slide, please. So far this week, you can see us at the end there of the graph, we are reporting 12 cases. But if we go to our next slide, please. We can see here in February, we've got already 74 
new cases that have been reported. Uh, so it is uh, likely that this month uh, may become our third highest month of new cases reporting since the pandemic began. Next slide, please. As for exposures, uh, here you can see how effectively the virus is being contained locally. Uh, certainly it's following a positive trend that most exposures or about 75% are occurring in high risk contacts. Community spread or those without an epidemiologic link uh, represent only 16% of cases since the beginning and only 10 of the 96 cases reported over the last four weeks. On our next slide, we can see that 43,200 of our residents have been tested at least once uh, and that is getting close to 30% of our population. Next slide, please. We can see we have one active outbreak in Peterborough right now, and that is at the Buckhorn Daycare and Nursery School. So far, we have identified 17 total cases connected to this outbreak. That's 11 attendees and six staff, and the daycare remains closed. Next slide, please. Here we see our cumulative case incidence rate uh, on the right hand side of 418 residents per 100,000 uh, for the past week ending yesterday. Our weekly case incidence rate is 16 per 100,000. So uh, next slide, please. Based on this and other data, you can see here that Peterborough is remaining uh, in the yellow zone for now. Uh, and uh, this map shows the zones of all the public health units in Ontario. And uh, you can see that we are right in between a sea of green and a sea of orange and red. So with that, I would like to focus um, my remarks today on two topics that I know are generating a lot of questions in our community, uh, vaccine rollout and some uh, guidance on how best to self-isolate and when. On the first front, I am pleased to report that with the new vaccine supply arriving this week, we have resumed immunization of our highest priority populations. As of 9 a.m. this morning, a total of 1,136 doses had been uh, administered in the community. This morning, our uh, public health teams have returned to long-term care homes to administer the second dose to residents. Yesterday, PRHC opened their vaccination clinic for health care workers. This group includes long-term care home staff, essential caregivers, and the highest priority healthcare workers who care for our most vulnerable residents. The goal is to have 2,500 of these highest priority local healthcare workers immunized by next week. We also will begin vaccinating retirement homes starting March the 5th. Our next significant priority is to vaccinate adults who are 80 years of age or older. Peterborough will be relying on the provincial booking system, which should be ready by March 15th for this purpose. We all want to see this next group of vulnerable community members get their vaccines. And I would just ask that you be patient a little bit longer until the province is ready to allow registration to occur. The booking system is called COVAX. And when it is ready, you will be able to book an appointment either online or by telephone. Trusted friends and family members will be able to do this on behalf of their eligible loved ones. As part of the immunization process, individuals who are immunocompromised or who have certain severe allergies will be asked to consult with their health care provider. So this message is for anyone in Peterborough who is waiting to register for a vaccine appointment. You can reach out 
to your family physician or nurse practitioner now to discuss the COVID-19 vaccines and your own personal health status. As soon as the provincial COVAX system is ready for our residents who are 80 years of old, 80 years old or older uh, to sign up, we will be pushing that information out to all of our communities in a variety of ways. In the meantime, please stay tuned and make sure you are only getting your information from credible sources. We've heard already about a phone scam where local residents are receiving calls asking them to sign up for a COVID-19 vaccination in exchange for a fee of $119 and the exchange of financial information. Please be warned and be aware that the vaccine is absolutely free and just be extremely cautious that there will be people out there trying to take advantage of others. Now, I would also like to touch on the recent changes to the COVID-19 screening tool that is being used by schools. That includes our private schools and childcare centers in Peterborough. If a student has just one symptom, they are required to be tested and their household members must self-isolate until the symptomatic person receives a negative COVID test or an alternative diagnosis from their healthcare provider. For those who are essential workers and who are deemed critical by their employer, they may still be able to work and remain self-isolated until the results for their child are available. And that usually takes 24 to 48 hours, as long as their child is not a high-risk contact of a case. Peterborough Public Health will work with employers to determine how they can assure that work self-isolation is done correctly. So to be clear, this may apply to healthcare workers and those who work in healthcare settings, such as home care, our hospital, long-term care, retirement homes, and other congregate care settings, to first responders, to childcare staff, school staff, and municipal staff that are supporting uh, critical functions such as water, wastewater, and road maintenance. Peterborough Public Health is willing to work with these local employers and their impacted staff as an interim measure while our local rates remain low and while we await further provincial direction. We recognize that this is a challenging time for families as we try to balance the need to work and preserve essential services like healthcare and schools at the same time while following public health measures. So as I wrap up, please don't forget what our mayor uh, of Selwyn has already reminded you, and that is when dining out, please only go out with your household members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salvatera. Okay, so now we have an opportunity to hear from our elected officials on the line, and I will invite uh, Chief Lori Carr, who's joining us from Hiawatha First Nation. Uh, Chief Carr, did you have any remarks you would like to share or just be available for questions? Hi, Brittany. Uh, no, I'm fine to just be available for questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, then I will now invite our MP, Miriam Monsef, uh, who's joining us, and I'm happy to put you on screen if you have some comments to share. Thank you so much, Brittany. Hello, everybody. Bonjour, Anin, Salam Aleikum, and happy final week of February. Uh, I'd like to focus my remarks today on two items. First, Canada, US, and second, vaccines. The Prime Minister met with President Biden and his team. Uh, the first virtual visit, if you will, from uh, the president to any country was Canada. And among the many areas of collaboration, uh, they focused on climate action, they focused on equity and women's participation in the economy and their well-being, and of course, 
greater collaboration on, on all things related to COVID. Uh, I will also share that the land border with the US will be closed for at least another month until March 21st for all but essential travel. Of course, the best way to avoid any potential border restrictions is to not travel. Uh, and that is the recommendation of the government of Canada for close to a year now. On vaccines, we continue to see a ramp up in vaccine deliveries. More than a million doses have been scheduled to arrive over the past two weeks, and provinces are starting to put in motion their vaccine rollout plans to the general public. Yesterday, the Prime Minister confirmed the delivery timelines for 1.3 million Moderna doses, which we were expecting in March. Uh, these delivery timelines are being shared with the provinces as updates become available so that they can plan their vaccination rollouts accordingly. We remain committed to working with the provinces to help them scale up vaccinations so that everyone who wants a vaccine can get one free of charge by September. Even if no additional vaccines are approved by Health Canada, we remain on track to receive 6 million vaccines by the end of March, 23 million between April and June, for a total of 84 million doses by the end of September. This means we'll have enough doses to vaccinate 14.5 million Canadians by the end of June, that is half of the entire adult population for the next few months until these vaccines are rolled out on a broader scale. We need to make sure that we continue to follow all public health advice, in particular with the arrival of the new variants in our region. We're getting closer and closer every day. We're almost there. Please stay safe, stay vigilant. Thank you so much, Miriam. Okay, so now we have um, an opportunity to hear from our uh, mayor of uh, Peterborough. If you have any uh, comments for us, Mayor Terrian, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Brittany, and thank you very much to everybody else on the line. Just want to highlight again the messages that were put forward before. Uh, Chair Mitchell said it best. We have the vaccines rolling out, but we still need to remain vigilant and make sure that we are doing our part. Uh, because there is light at the end of the tunnel and out my window I can see sun today, so hopefully y'all can too. Um, but in order to proceed with the reopening that we've seen, we do need to be adhering to the guidelines, best practices that we're all well familiar with by now because it's been close to a year. Uh, so the city continues to work with uh, public health, provincial and federal partners on the vaccine rollout, on other um, on other facilities that we can help with. Anything that we can do, we're working on and we will continue to do that. So thank you very much and I'll be here for questions. Excellent, thank you so much, Mayor Tarian. Okay, so we now have a chance to um, turn it over to our media colleagues and um, I will um, invite each of you to ask your questions of Dr. Salvatera. So let's start with uh, Taylor Clydesdale from uh, Peterborough this week and Mike Kawartha. So if you've got some questions, please go right ahead, Taylor. Yes, awesome, thanks Brittany. Um, just first question, I had a couple that I had written down prepared, but just uh, based off of your opening statements, Dr. Salvatera, I'm wondering if you have any more information about uh, this phone scam that's been going around. Are you aware if anyone's actually fallen for this phone scam, if anyone has been defrauded? No, I don't, Taylor, but I do know that the family health team did report it to the police for further investigation. So hopefully that's happening. Okay. So police are already involved then? I, well, I believe the police have been contacted and advised uh, about the uh, the report. Okay. Um, I just had a couple of questions in regards to, um, oh, I have my questions pulled up here, but um, just in regards to the um, uh, uh, business blitz that resulted in several fines uh, mm -hmm. uh, this past week. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, you might be able to answer some questions about, you know, what, what were some of the reasons that some fines were laid out? I know Julie Ingram has been answering a lot of these questions. I don't know if she's available today or if you're able to answer. Uh, well, I, I think we're still, I, I, well, I know we are still awaiting official results 
from the multi-ministerial uh, enforcement campaign. So I, I'm not able to answer your question specifically. What I do know is that uh, the uh, with from what they have shared with us is that they uh, inspected 260 premises throughout Peterborough, that they laid seven charges uh, to seven different businesses, they issued 36 formal warnings, uh, and they issued 17 orders under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So I, I understand that a key area where compliance was lacking was the need for staff and workers to be actively screened before they came to work. And that was a change that was implemented uh, as the stay home orders were lifted. And so it appears that uh, se several of our local businesses are still not in full compliance with that. Okay. Um, now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the fine for, for corporations uh, and we don't have any evidence that corporations are or aren't the ones that were were uh, the, the recipients of those fines, but the the fines for them are a thousand dollars. Is that correct? Yes, a corporation that violates the Reopening Ontario Act can be subject to a set fine of a thousand dollars, and so the fine is certainly a, a tool to help uh, encourage compliance. Uh, and the corporation can be fined uh, multiple times for non-compliance. So this can accumulate. Uh, if this charge doesn't, uh, uh, isn't successful in getting the compliance that's needed, officers can use other tools such as proceeding with a part three summons under the Provincial Offenses Act. Okay, so what does that entail? Oh, well, uh, well, I believe there it entails at least a court appearance uh, with the possibility of higher fines and other penalties. Okay, and I think that does lead into my, my next question, which is, you know, what stops larger businesses, um, big corporations from just eating these fines and deciding this is the cost of doing business right now? Uh, and well... All types and sizes of businesses are subject to the same legislative requirements uh, and the size of the business alone isn't considered when the legislation is being applied or enforced. I think that under the uh, with the part three summons and the uh, under the Provincial Offenses Act, there is the ability to um, leverage higher fines, more significant penalties. Uh, so if it uh, if, if you need a larger deterrent because of the size of the business, I believe that is possible. Okay. And you're not aware of any uh, businesses that have gotten to that stage in Peterborough yet? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, and I guess, just do you think that the, the um, rules that have been set out, this legislation, do you think it's fair to businesses large and small? Well, I do. I do think it's fair. Uh, we all need to be uh, um, we all need to be complying with the public health measures. And if you actually look at the regulation, there are some requirements that are actually levied against individuals. So you and I are also accountable for our behavior. So the the requirement to stay two meters apart from everyone else when we are in a place of business or any other place, that is now, that's a legal requirement and we can be fined if we are not compliant. So we all have carry the responsibility to ensure that we are following the public health measures and doing our best to keep people safe, especially as the variants of concern become more prevalent in Ontario because they are so easily transmitted uh, that we have to be vigilant about our behaviors. Okay. I think that's all the questions that I have for today. I'll pass it on to my media partners. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. welcome. Thank you very much, Taylor. Okay, uh, so also joining us, and I see her hand is up, is Marlis Kirkman, and she is a columnist from Buckhorn who writes for The Examiner. So if you've got some questions, Marlis, please go right ahead. 
I do, <clears throat> excuse me, I do. I have one question. Um, I talked with Moira, who is the director of Trent Daycare yesterday. And Moira told me that Buckhorn was being, daycare was being cleaned on Friday and was scheduled for reopening on Monday. Do you have any comments on that? I don't have the details. I'm sorry. We we'll have to um, we'll have to uh, check back with our case and contact team mm -hmm. and uh, and get back to you on that. Right. I and I was going to call Mo Moira again. I thought while you're there, I'll ask. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Well, we we can get back to you on that. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, if I could add to that. Um, we, uh, I, I did follow up with um, our manager of infectious diseases, and uh, she's suggesting to, with regard to any reopening, to contact the facility directly. So, Marlis, you might want to call the Buckhorn Daycare to get a sense of their status. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, oh, Matthew's been quick off the mark. So, Matthew Barker from the Examiner, I see your hand is up. So, if you have questions for Dr. Salvatera, please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Salvatera. Um, so with regards to the UK variant that is now being um, detected in the Peterborough area, uh, how much of a concern is that with regards to, uh, I guess, um, contaminating the area, I guess, for lack of a better word? So, so first of all, I, I'll clarify. We know that there's a variant. We're still waiting for the g genome to be sequenced. That takes about 14 days. So... Um, I, I think we'll have to wait and see which which variant it turns out to be. But we definitely know, it, uh, I think we have uh, strong reasons to believe it, it is it is going to be a confirmed positive and it will be one of the variants. Um, as far as our concerns about what this means for the community, I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire. And so, of course, we are worried that there are other uh, people who are infected with the variant in our community. Fortunately for this particular case, uh, there is only one other high risk contact who's been tested already once, will be tested a second time, uh, and uh, is in currently in self-isolation. And we believe that the individual was infected by a former roommate who was a high risk contact of a variant case in another part of the province who came here and now has gone back, which again, I think is really good reason why we should not have visitors here from other parts of the province. Even though we don't have a stay at home order, we really need to stay close to home and we should not be traveling because that's how the virus will travel. So I don't have a great deal of concern, Matthew, with this one particular case of the variant. But of course, I am concerned that there are others out there and that we just haven't found them yet. All right. My follow-up question to that is with regards to the variant. Um, virologists have said as a virus becomes more contagious, it becomes less deadly. Now, with that in mind, do you have any concerns that this might create more deadly outbreak in the area? Well, first of all, by, by frequency alone, the more people you have sick, the more deadlier the virus comes, right? Because it's you just it's a multiplier effect and everybody, it doesn't take much to do the math to know that the more people you have sick times the case fatality rate, the more people are going to die. With the UK, with the with the B117 variant, uh, so far there's only been one report that is uh, alleging that this variant is also more serious. Um, it that those findings have not been replicated. So I think we are still waiting to learn more about the B117 and the other variants to understand whether there is whether the, along with transmissibility are they in fact more virulent. So stay tuned on that one. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, uh, Matt. Um, so let's hear from Paul Rellinger uh, from Kawartha Now. Go right ahead, Paul. Uh, thanks so much, Brittany. A um, couple questions for you, Dr. Salvatore, and if I could, a question for Chief Carr. Um, the outbreak, uh, I want to speak about the outbreak um, 
in um, in Buckhorn. Um, is there a particular concern when you have, or a special concern when you have a Buckhorn, uh, an outbreak in a smaller community like Buckhorn, as opposed to a, a bigger city like Peterborough? Are there special challenges that are presented when the community is smaller, tighter knit? Anything that comes to mind? No, I don't think so, Paul. It's all really about the the number of social contacts, the number of, uh, and and those can be high regardless of the setting, whether it's a rural community where families and other people come together uh, or an urban community where people are living in much closer proximity to one, an one another, where there's more crowding. So I, I, I think either setting has its own unique qualities and I don't think they really make much of a difference. It's really the number of contacts that a case has had. That's really the significant factor here for risk. And sure, I I assumed as much, but just wanted to to chat. I mean, the one the thing I may add, excuse me, Paul. That, it, the one thing I may add is that, for example, in larger cities where people are traveling by public transit, for example, and you really can't maintain distance, that there might be more opportunities for exposure uh, than you would have in a smaller community where people are using their private vehicles for for transportation so in fact you might have more risk because of that in an urban setting but it's probably half of one you know half dozen of one and and half dozen of the other perfect um as for the 17 cases that are associated with that outbreak so far is that seem to be does that seem to be is that number topped out like are there still more results weighted back on other close contacts well, there are still people who are being followed as high risk contacts. And so we will be testing them with the new guidance. Uh, we are testing all high risk contacts twice, at least usually twice, once at the beginning and then once again after the seventh day of isolation. So we do we will be doing more testing. Uh, and of course, if anyone becomes symptomatic while they're in quarantine, then they will be tested as well. OK, um, thank you. And uh, one more thing, um, when we look at our overall numbers for the region and we talk about or look forward to the prospect of moving to possibly the green zone or green level, um, are these numbers that we currently have just too high to even contemplate that happening anytime soon? <laughs> I think green is but wishful thinking right now, Paul. Given given what we're we've seen in the last week, and uh, uh, I I'm just glad that we're hanging on to yellow. Can we maintain yellow going forward? Uh, the push is the. I mean, I think all of the pressures are that we will see greater numbers of cases, especially with the variants of concern circulating. So how long can we stay at yellow? Um, it would be wonderful to go to green. Uh, I just don't know if it's possible. And and what's interesting, I'm sure you'd agree, is you wouldn't have said that a week ago. The numbers were, were it shows how fast things can change, I guess. Sorry, right. you cut out there. What did I was it just show? saying a week. I was saying a week ago you wouldn't have said that or didn't say that, and it just shows how fast things can change. I guess things can change in a day. And when and when we reviewed our data with the province just a couple of days ago, we were a rainbow. Peterborough was a rainbow. We had you know one or two indicators that were in green. We had you know two or three that were yellow. We had an orange. <laughs> and so we're we're a bit of a rainbow, but I think we we should stay in yellow. I think yellow is a good place to be right now. Absolutely. Um, and just a clarification. Can you just spell COVAX for me uh, if you have it? COVAX? In front yeah. Sure. It's um, capital letters C-O-V, small letters A-X. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Salvatore. I appreciate that. Um, for Chief Carr, if she's still on the line. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a quick question. It is, and I don't know if this has been asked before, and I apologize if it has. Is Hiawatha open now to uh, to non-residents as well to come and go in, onto the First Nation Reserve? 
Hi, Paul. We are open to uh, green, yellow, and orange zones. We're not um, we're not having people in from the red and gray zones. We do have a um, at our store. We have um, security checking um, to ensure that there's no one coming in from those zones. But yes, our our store gas bar. Um, um, those area that area is open. the The other areas that remain closed are the like the general public areas. But it is winter anyway. But our ball diamond and boat launch and and those pieces are closed right now for to the general public. Okay, and and thank you. And how how is that uh, checking of of origin being checked? Is it a verbal thing, or are they checking driver's licenses, or uh, they're checking licenses? Okay, cool. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think that needed to be clarified because I, I hadn't heard it asked, so I just wanted to check with you. Um, yeah. Appreciate it so much, and thank you, Brittany. Thank okay, you. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay, so let's uh, hear now from Matt Latour uh, from uh, Freak and Oldies Radio. If you've got some questions for Dr. Salvatera, please go right ahead. Yeah, I've got one for Dr. Salvatera. I missed the first couple of minutes of the call, so if this was mentioned already, my apologies. <laughs> Um, I know we've got a variant case locally here now. Is there any differences in the type of quarantine or the length of quarantine that that individual would have to do uh, because they're a variant case and not a normal COVID case? So, so I think I, I think the question was, is there any difference in the quarantine or the self-isolation if you're a variant versus uh, another? And the answer is no. It's still the same incubation period. Uh, sorry, it's still the same amount of uh, time to clear the virus. I mean, I think with um, with the variants of concern, we are still on trying to understand whether uh, people shed more of the virus. Is there a greater load that is shed? Is that one of the reasons why it's more transmissible? But for now, with the evidence that we have, we're sticking with the uh, same period of self-isolation. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, okay, moving on to Jessica Nisnik from Global News. Uh, Jessica, go ahead. Thank you, Brittany. Um, sometimes going last, all my questions have been asked, but today somehow it's created a lot of questions, so I apologize okay. up front. Dr. Salvatera, 17 people, uh, staff and kids at Buckhorn. Yes. How do you think that happened if there's, I know it's a broad question, but were the self-screening measures not happening or like, how does it get that high? Uh, good question, Jessica. I'm not sure what what the analysis of the outbreak uh, has shown. Uh, why, why Buckhorn? Why there? Uh, why so many? But that is a question we can pass on to our team. And if they have a hypothesis, we'd be happy to share it with you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And uh, I know you're going back to long term care homes. Are we within the time frame? I know you were hoping, I think, to be in there last week and I missed Friday's meeting, so I feel out of the loop. Were were they going to make it within the, t the recommended time frame? Well, we we did uh, consult with, the, we have advised the province that we were going to be a few days late if we didn't get more Moderna. Uh, and the province advised us that we were still within the acceptable range. So uh, we are uh, we, we are getting more Moderna this week. We've already started to re-immunize with the second dose. We, we had some remaining from the first uh, two, uh, two shipments. Uh, so enough to to get started and then we will use the additional moderna to complete that second dose so we're we're fine as far as getting those doses done for our long-term care home residents okay thanks so you mentioned the self-isolating at work if mm -hmm. you're an essential worker but i those wor the workers that you mentioned all sound very hands-on so so i mean they'd have to be i guess redesignated to administrative duties? How, how no, would that work? Uh, no, if you go online, Jessica, to uh, Public Health Ontario, you will see there's a fact sheet 
for how to do work self-isolation. It's something that we've uh, used with healthcare workers who, uh, for whatever reason, they are still, uh, they're, they're isolating and they still need, they're needed at work because they perform a critical function. It does require them wearing their PPE, personal protective equipment for the full duration of their shift uh, and ensuring that they maintain that physical distance from, uh, from everyone. Uh, I know here in Peterborough Public Health, we're also looking into creating uh, a separate area where any uh, work self-isolating uh, staff can work and we're going to also implement uh, a more uh, rigorous cleaning and disinfection of that area. So there are ways that it can be done, but it needs to be done properly. Uh, and that's why in my remarks, I did um, share that we are willing to work with the employers to make sure that, uh, because not everyone is a healthcare worker, not everyone understands maybe, you know, all of the infection prevention and control practices that are required in order to isolate at work. So we will work with the employer and any impacted parent to uh, make sure they can do it appropriately and safely. Okay, thank you. Lastly, you, you touched on this already, but I will say after I last reported that it was legislated that we stay two meters apart, people mm -hmm. had a really hard time understanding that. They seem to think it's a provincial, they seem to think it's your directive and not a provincial directive because your measures have always been a bit stricter and rightfully so, it's kept our numbers low. But can you maybe just reiterate that it's not you, it's the province? Because yeah, I know. Yes. Thanks. But just can say you it's see on that? South Can you see that? Regulation 6, uh, 364. Okay, I'm going to read to you uh, from requirements that apply to individuals. So this is section 3.1, subsection 4. Every member of the public in a place of business or facility that is open to the public shall maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from every other person, except from their caregiver or from members of the person's household. And I've highlighted it there. So it's right there. So it is a provincial regulation. Uh, and so it means it is enforceable and people need to comply. So this does not, it's, so it's a responsibility that we share. It's not only up to the business provider to say, hey, you uh, keep two, two meters away and, and don't butt in line and don't go down that aisle if, if people are in it. It also means that each one of us have an obligation to maintain those two meters of distance when we are out. Excellent. Thank you. I just need you to tell people again because it's hard sometimes to get the message across. <laughs> I feel like it needs to be broadcasted every day. <laughs> um, lastly, lastly for you, and then I just wanted to ask Chief Carr when the um, First Nation reopened. Uh, I saw a business owner on the street the other day that's restaurant owner says he got an $800 fine for not posting his capacity. Um, uh, for for the store, the store limit. Now, it's typically been Peterborough Public Health's policy to educate first, and I know that has been happening. But when the rules change for businesses, um, do you not offer that same courtesy, or is it just zero tolerance at this point for any changes? That's up to them to abide and follow. Uh, that's really a good question for Julie to answer, uh, Jessica, because she's the one, it's her team that's out there doing that educational and the enforcement approaches with our businesses. And there may be a reason why something goes from an educational approach to an enforcement approach. Uh, but I, I, I think, in fact, she did answer a, a similar question when she was on with us last week. Um, but that might be something you would like to have a conversation conversation with with her to get a little more of a, of a perspective on what the, what the difference is and when would one apply and, and, and not the other. She just put her hand up. So Brit, it, d Julie, is Julie wanna... on the line? She is. Go ahead, Julie, if you're able to answer. Maybe. 
I don't hear you, Julie, you're on mute. Oh, we may be experiencing some technical challenges. No problem, no problem. Okay, sorry um, about that. That's okay, maybe she'll pop up eventually, and if not, that's totally fine. And just a lastly for Chief Carr, I was just wondering, when did Hiawatha reopen to non-residents? We, we reopened on uh, February 22nd, the same day as uh, the rest of the province. And we have all the same, if not um, a little more um, measures in place, meaning um, we have people at the door to screen, uh, take your name. Um, we only allowed so many people in at a time, three, I believe is the, the number. And uh, we have dividers uh, up in our restaurant. Um, again, it's all the same protocols and we've enhanced a little bit. We have somebody just cleaning. So we're really trying to uh, go above and beyond even the, the provincial expectations just to ensure the safety of not only our citizens, but also the, the people that come to visit us. Okay, thanks. I know my parents will be happy they can go back to the restaurant. That's it for <laughs> me. Thank you very much. I know it took a lot of time, so I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. Brittany, are you on mute? Sorry, yeah, my, my apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. Um, so I just will check in with Reg Watson from the Examiner. Did you have any questions for Dr. Salvatera, Reg? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, great. Um, then I think um, that brings us to a close. And um, I'm just reading, it looks like Julie indeed was having some microphone challenges, but um, we will try Jessica to connect you with her a little later. Um, okay, so uh, with that, then I think we've wrapped up for today. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you back here next Thursday, March 4th. So can't believe we're getting into March already. Um, have a great uh, rest of your week and weekend everyone and uh, stay safe uh, and we thank you again. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.